you're in touch with Sinto in the Evening on WING. You can take part by calling 457-1410. In Springfield and Clark County, 1-800-835-1410. Since the show operates on a delay system, please remember to turn your radio completely down or off when your call is answered. You're going to hear the program over the phone. Also, if you're calling long distance or from a payphone, tell our producer, and we'll take your call next. And thanks for listening to the most stimulating evening show in the Miami Valley on Radio 1410 WING. Good evening to you. Sento in the evening continues. And we are uh, indeed honored to have with us uh, a gentleman, probably one of the folks closest to uh, former President Richard Milhouse Nixon. And uh, the latest book is The China Card, and uh, just one of the comments about The China Card, uh, advance praise, if you will, for it, a yeasty mix of politics, history, personality marvelously, marvelously enriched by innumerable major and minor insights and observations available only to an insider. That from Thomas Fleming, the author of The Officer's Wives. Uh, I have had the, uh, the good fortune, I, I should say, to read uh, uh, The Company, and uh, I might say, in fact, we'll talk to John Ehrlichman about that. I, I didn't think it translated very well to television. It, it lost a lot of the translation. The book was excellent. Uh, and the whole truth, I have not read Witness to Power of the Nixon Years, nor have I had a chance to read the China card yet. But joining us on the Newsmaker Line right now is Mr. John Ehrlichman. And, uh, John, thank you for coming on with us. Pleasure. Uh, did you get the same impression that I did, uh, obviously, you being the author of the book, uh, the company was was very powerful. In fact, uh, William Sapphire calls it gripping and powerful. And uh, I, I I didn't think it translated as powerfully to television. Did you agree with that? Yeah, it. Uh, they stretched it out to twelve hours. You remember? Yes. And it wasn't that thick a book. <laughs> yeah, it was. It, it was called I think Washington uh, Behind Closed Doors, if I'm not right. mistaken. And uh, actually, the the television play was. Uh, two hours at the beginning, right from the book, and two hours at the end, right from the book, and eight hours in the middle that I didn't really recognize. <laughs> Poetic license, I guess, right? Uh, something like that. Uh, John, it is uh, indeed a, a pleasure to have you here, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong on your position uh, in the Nixon administration. You were, I believe, uh, legal counsel and foreign affairs advisor. No, no. I started out as counsel to the president, and I did that for about ten months. Yes. Then I became assistant to the president for domestic affairs. Domestic affairs, okay. Right. Henry Kissinger had the foreign affairs. Foreign affairs, affairs that's okay. Uh, the China card is, uh, you know, when we talk, uh, I guess, about poetic license, it, it, it appears, at least from the, uh, the excerpts that I have seen of it and, and in going through the book, uh, it appears that it is very close to a, a nonfiction work, uh, and it, yet it is a novel. Um, how close is it? Well, uh, it's hard to quantify. Certainly, the scenery uh, and some of the some of the people who form the background for the story are real people and real events and real places. Uh, but the the main story is about some Chinese people and some Americans uh, who are purely fictional and who play out their drama against that background. They interact with the real people, of course, and uh, the real people have great impact on their lives. But uh, basically, it's a story of a young fellow named Matt Thompson who comes out of Harvard Law School, and he goes to work for a law firm in New York and eventually ends up in the White House, in the Nixon White House, and he ends up on Henry Kissinger's staff. And in the process of getting there, uh, he is co-opted by the Chinese, and uh, uh, he agrees to become their agent, in effect. And so uh, the Chinese have a man on the Kissinger staff. Now, I I would have to say that in in looking at uh, the Nixon years in the White House, that uh, that the opening of the door uh, with China, the People's Republic of China, uh, had to be I think in in foreign affairs uh, uh, parameters uh, probably the single greatest achievement we have seen in the last couple of decades. Uh, would you tend to agree with that? And, and I would, and that's one of the reasons that I felt. Uh uh, that I was strongly interested in, in doing this book because it seemed to me one of the most dramatic incidents of perhaps the last 25 or 30 years since the war. Uh, how much uh, does the book uh, deal with the personalities of those involved, uh, the Henry Kissingers, uh, the Hagues, uh, the Nixons? Well, um, is, it, is, it more, is it more dealing with 
the uh, what is happening and with Matt Thompson, or is it dealing with the personalities of all those involved? Now, to you agree? see those people, and you see them in uh, rather intimate situations, working uh, with one another, working with their staff. Uh, but, uh, you know, I had a tremendous advantage in writing this book, because I don't have to describe Richard Nixon to anybody, or Henry Kissinger for that matter. Uh, I can just tell the reader that that's who it is that walked in the room, and they have in their own minds a pretty good visualization and, a, and uh, also a pretty good characterization. So I was able to just shorthand uh, those kinds of introductions. All of your books uh, really deal with that experience, uh, the years you spent uh, in the White House. I'm working on one right now that doesn't. That does not, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, I'm well into another novel, mm -hmm. uh, which is contemporary. Ah, okay. Uh, a little change of pace then for John well, Elephant. Uh, it's it very, as you say, it's out of the genre. Is uh, obviously you spent uh, you spent 18 months in federal prison, uh, and and Watergate certainly. I, I hope it's something that by now people are beginning to to put in the back of their minds and in the back of the history books a little bit, but um, was, obviously from your writings, uh, it was something that affected your life a great deal. Um, it, was it something you found to some degree rewarding? Well, it, it's pretty hard to find anything rewarding in the Watergate experience. No, not in the Watergate. No, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the years preceding that. Oh, no question but what it was rewarding. Absolutely. I was, uh, you know, a lawyer from a just a medium-sized town and had had no real um, broad canvas experience. And all of a sudden, I was I was put in situations where uh, I was meeting some really fantastic people and working on projects that were far beyond anything I had a right to imagine. Let's go to the phone lines for John Ehrlichman, and he will be with us uh, until 9 o'clock. And we say hello to Jay from Belmont. Hello. Uh, hello, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Ehrlichman, I'm about three-fourths of the way through your book, so don't tell me how it ends. Oh, I wouldn't think of it. <laughs> uh, you're, you're a very, uh, very well-gifted writer. I, I'll give you that. I, I didn't appreciate a lot of things that went on during the Nixon administration, but uh, I'll say that you're a good author. Well, thank you. Uh, early in the book, you, you kind of paint the president as a... A man is unsure of himself and more concerned about his place in history, and he's not really a pleasant person to be around. But certainly the first two, unsure of himself and very, very much concerned about his place in history. You got that exactly right. Uh, he could be pleasant. Uh, he worked at it when he was. Uh, he didn't have much of a sense of humor. He, he could be fascinating on the subjects that he was deeply interested in, um, on subjects he wasn't deeply interested in, uh, he just tuned you out. Mm -hmm. I had a friend one time who would go to parties, and if it wasn't a great party, he'd go upstairs and find a bedroom and go to sleep. And it's a little bit like that. If if you were not on a on a subject that uh, Nixon really could fasten his mind onto, why he he drift off and think about other things. I must say one thing too. Uh, I imagine you really get tired of talking about Watergate, but I think during that whole period of time, the the, the uh, most unfair interview I ever saw was a 60 Minutes interview. They put you on there and they, and they blew the whole TV screen up and had your face right there. Wasn't that something? Uh, that was that was unfair. There, there was a little additional problem with that in that they moved some of the answers around. <laughs> they they have a tendency of doing that, Mr. Ehrlichman, from what I hear. They have a tendency to do that, I yeah, understand. I, it, didn't, it didn't come out quite like it went in. So uh, of, all the, of all the television that I'm invited to do these days, that is the one show I will not do. Well, I, I really thought it was unfair, and I wish you the best. Well, thank you. If you refuse to do it, though, thank you, Jay. If you refuse to do it, they'll stand in front of your house, though, and say, John, refuse to comment. Well, that's all right. <laughs> okay. do that. They have done that. Okay, let's go to uh, Ray from Beaver Creek. You're on with John Ehrlichman. How are you, Mr. Ehrlichman? Fine, thank you. Uh, I just got a, one comment, and, and uh, it has to do with, you know, it's about the old times, but uh, like the gentleman said, during the Watergate years and stuff, uh, there was a lot of people, a lot of innocent people, uh, that weren't doing anything different than the previous administration had ever done. And the only thing that happened was somebody got caught. And unfortunately, gentlemen, you were it. But I'll tell you one thing. I have more respect for the Nixon administration than any administration ever because they weren't afraid to step forward and say 
and do what they thought was best. And during the Vietnam years, I'll tell you what, I was on my way over there, and the man stopped it, and I probably wouldn't have came back because yeah. the odds were against me. Yeah. And I have a lot of respect for that man. And uh, the people who worked with him because the people who worked with him were the one that made the man. Well. And uh, I'd like to thank all of you. Uh, he's he's looking better and better in some in some ways, and, and people are getting more perspective on that period of time. You know the. The whole Watergate business stood up awfully, awfully uh, big in the foreground for a long time, and it made it impossible for people to realize that some pretty good stuff had been done. Yeah, and if, if people were, you know, they don't realize that uh, Harry Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, they all had their secrets, they all had their internal sources, so that they knew what was going on in the country. You have to. You know, it's not something that you can turn your back on and say, Hey, you know, I I was blind to that. They have to know what the internal workings of the nation are, or they can't run the nation. Well, there's much in what you say. You know, so uh, I I just like to tell you people I really do appreciate what you did for our country, uh, even though <clears throat> some other people disagree. So to it, that's the reason. Ray, thank you for your comments. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Uh, John, do you get tired of talking about Watergate? Well, you know, I don't talk about it all that much, except when I come out to talk about a book. And then, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm asked about these things sometimes, uh, and that's fine. That's, that's okay. Is there a, you know, for, I guess, last year, I'm trying to remember now, it's been in the, in the last couple of years, uh, there's been talk uh, from the political arena, at least I've heard some comments, that uh, you know, a, a new birth for Richard Nixon, the statesman, uh, that uh, indeed... You know, Watergate was behind us, and uh, we are seeing a new Richard Nixon come out now and, and talk more. I haven't heard much about that in the last six or seven months. Did you get that same perception that uh, that maybe people were, I think you alluded to that a moment ago, that people were willing to look at him more for his accomplishments as opposed to what happened in Watergate? Well, yeah, you know, back last, uh, what, back in May, I guess, Newsweek had a cover story on him. And the gist of that was that he had had a, a kind of a, re, a resurrection or a rehabilitation or whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they focused on um, his uh, giving advice to George Shultz and, and Ronald Reagan and so on and, and said he, had, uh, uh, he was doing well in the polls and whatnot. Uh, the one, the one thing you have to be a little guarded about in all of that, of course, is that the Nixon archives have been locked up all these years. All those thousands of hours of tapes and all the paperwork from the, the, that White House have not been available to the newspapers or the historians. And one of these days, all the lawsuits will be over, and that stuff will all come rolling out. When that happens, I think uh, Nixon's going to dip in the polls again for a while. You know, I, that'll be, you know, that'll be front page stuff. Yeah, I want to I want to get back to your books in a moment, and I and I do invite callers at four five seven fourteen ten to talk to John Ehrlichman. But I, I did want to ask you uh, uh, one other question that that has always gone through my mind, uh, just a philosophical question, I guess, and it's speculation at best. But uh, was it your impression, and and in all the years, and I've I've been doing talk shows since uh, the end of the Watergate era, but you know, of all the the conversation that came out, a lot of people have said. Had Nixon come out in the beginning and said, you know, yes, you know, I hear here is my dirty linen, uh, the people of America would have accepted it. Uh, they it certainly would have been a black mark, but there would have been a no no impeachment proceedings, and uh, he would have served out his term. Do you think that's true? Yeah, I do. I think there was a time, probably in uh, oh January or February 1973 when he could have done that and uh, the American people, the vast majority of the American people would have said right on, put it behind you and keep going. Mm -hmm. uh, by uh, May or June, I think it was probably too late. There was just one one window of opportunity there, but uh, Nixon just couldn't bring himself to do that. Okay. We're going to take a break. Uh, our guest on the Newsmaker line is John Ehrlichman, the author of The China Card and uh, several other uh, great works, the company, the whole truth, witness to power, the Nixon years. And if you uh, have any questions, comments, or thoughts about uh, either his books, if you've uh, had a chance to read the books, or about uh, the Watergate years, about the Nixon years, give us a call at 457-1410 in Springfield and Clark County, 1-800-835-1410. Get involved. 
Call Mike Sinto now at 457-1410 on WING. Former uh, chief counsel to uh, the president of the United States, Richard Nixon, uh, is with us on the Newsmaker Line. John Ehrlichman, we're talking about the China card. Um, John, to those of us who... Uh, who just sit out here and, and watch what happens in Washington and, and uh, with respect to foreign affairs, and we will occasionally, I guess now we are a little more open to that with Senate proceedings being televised and the House of Representative proceedings being televised, neither of which I guess were um, were going on when you were uh, were in office. Uh, and next they'll be televising the Oval Office meetings. I won't hold my breath for that. Don't bet on it. Yeah, but, uh, you know, how, how intricate, you know, I, it, we just... We just heard one day that Richard Nixon was going to China. We were going to open the doors after all these years. Uh, you know, how long did this take to build up to this? Uh, it took a long time. Uh, it started before he ever went into office with some writing that he did on the subject. And I, I try and trace this as the background for the China card because uh, uh, it's, it's extremely interesting to me. He saw uh, early that uh, the American people... Uh, could be buffeted badly. There could be a lot of opposition to an approach to China, uh, and that he had to get all his ducks in a row, uh, work it out with the Chinese, and then spring it on the American public, uh, and particularly on the right wing of the Republican Party, as an accomplished fact. So um, there was a lot of secret negotiation the Romanians, the Pakistanis, the French were all go-betweens. And the countries uh, met face-to-face -face in Warsaw. The ambassadors from the two countries met in Warsaw, uh, supposedly to discuss the resolution of the Korean conflict. Uh, and messages were passed back and forth over a period of years. What what time frame are we talking well, about this point? We're talking about 1969, 1970, okay. and on into 1971. Mm -hmm. And finally, a message came through that, that a, an emissary from the president would be welcome to discuss uh, a visit by the president. And that was the thing that uh, Nixon and Kissinger were both angling for in the messages that they sent to the Chinese. So um, uh, you, you remember when the ping pong players were invited? Yes, yes. That was very symbolic. That was a, that was a very... Uh, uh, dramatic symbol uh, sent by Joe and Lai to the Americans that uh, uh, he was he was ready to deal, and um, uh, very shortly after that, it was arranged that Kissinger would go on a trip uh, to France by way of Pakistan, and of course in Pakistan he he supposedly became ill and was confined to a guest house. And he disappeared from sight for three days. And every day his assistants would come out, uh, shuttle into the house to meet with him and come out again. And the press would watch him go in and, and come out. And uh, bulletins were issued on his health and so on. Well, all the time he was up in Beijing uh, having meetings with Zhou Enlai. And uh, he came, uh, then he went on to Paris and, and negotiated with the North Vietnamese and finally came back to uh, San Clemente and uh, uh, reported to Richard Nixon, and then it was within 24 hours that Nixon Television and announced that he was going to China. How, how much uh, was, was Chairman Mao uh, involved, and how much was he just, uh, at that point, a figurehead? Uh, getting older, uh, illness, uh, was he, was he uh, an intricate part, or was it uh, Cho and Lai? Well, remember, China was in the middle of the Cultural Revolution at that time. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, Zhou Enlai and uh, the defense minister, who was a, an old uh, marshal named Lin Bao, and Mao Zedong's wife, Zhang Jing, were all um, uh, uh, part of the power structure in China. But they were contending with each other, and as a matter of fact, there's good evidence that there was a plot to assassinate Mao that was led by Lin Bao, this defense minister. So China was really in turmoil at that time. Mao was the symbolic leader, and the Red Guards, the you know the young people who were tearing around, uh, uh, throwing out the establishment and uh, ripping up uh, records and libraries and all that kind of thing. 
uh, he was he was still the symbol of China to those people. So when Nixon first went, uh, his uh, initial meeting with Mao Zedong was extremely important because it put Mao's blessing on the visit. Then from there on, Nixon negotiated with Zhou Enlai. And I think, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, he saw Mao one more time, very briefly. But uh, Mao did not engage in the negotiation. And as a matter of fact, after uh, after Chairman Mao died, uh, wasn't Jiang Jing either arrested or exiled? Yeah, she's one of the gang of four. Okay. She's, she's still in jail. But uh, an extraordinary woman, very vindictive, uh, uh, had a screw loose, in my opinion, mm -hmm. um, used the, the occasion of the Cultural Revolution to um, uh, either have killed or imprisoned people who had slighted her in some little way, socially or professionally, when she was trying to be a movie actress. And she was a real terror. Okay, we are talking uh, on the Newsmaker Line. We are honored to have with us John Ehrlichman, the author of The China Card and several other uh, fascinating works uh, on his years um, in the Nixon White House. And we invite your calls and comments. Doug from the North Side, you'll be up next, and we'll be back right after this. <laughs> Your say with Cinto in the evening on WING. He's a sweetheart of a guy, and you can talk to him by calling 457 1410. An open line at 457 1410, toll free in Ohio, 1 800 835 1410, to talk to John Ehrlichman, the author of The China Card, uh, a novel about uh, probably. As I said earlier, and uh, John, I believe, agreed with me, uh, uh, singly in the last couple of decades, the uh, most, uh, the, the biggest stride we've taken in foreign policy and opening the door to China, and we invite your calls and comments. Let's go to the phones for John Ehrlichman and Doug from North Dayton. Hi. Hi. How are you? Fantastic, sir. Good. I have a couple of uh, questions and maybe um, uh, John Ehrlichman would like to comment on or answer if he can. Sure. Uh, they are both concerning Watergate. And it's something that bothered, have bothered me over quite a few years. Uh, the first one is that, as I understand it, the plumbers that uh, conducted the Watergate episode were uh, trained uh, CIA experts, uh, trained in uh, conducting Mission Impossible exercises type of thing. And the question I have is, if they are that good, uh, how did they screw it up so badly? That's the first question I have. The second question, throat. <laughs> well, it's, that's, I'll take the second one first. That's easy. I haven't any idea. I, <laughs> well, I, have, a even sure the I have a suspicion who Deep Throat is. Sir? I have a suspicion who Deep Throat is. Well, then you have the advantage of me, because uh, nobody that I could recognize fits the description in that book. Well, I, it's the one who has access to the tapes. Well. Alexander Haig. Well, that's an interesting thought. Or Hal Holbrook, I believe, in the movie, wasn't it? Oh, uh, well. <laughs> anyway. Whatever. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, movies, uh, first... real life is different. Okay. As to your first question, the the uh, uh, four or five people who became known as the plumbers yeah. uh, were only partly involved in Watergate. There's a fellow named Hunt and a fellow named Liddy. Uh, Hunt and Liddy are, you know, I'm familiar with the, the case on Hunt with... In, in Florida that he's been found involved in not only that but with uh, John Kennedy's assassination because okay well there were there were several other people in the so-called plumbers mm -hmm. uh, Krogh and Young and and somebody else whose name doesn't come right now who were Barker. not in any way involved in the Watergate break-in well what about Barker the guy across the street in the well hotel? now that's a whole bunch of that's a whole bunch of Cubans that were hired as I understand it by uh, the committee to re-elect the president by McCord and by uh, Liddy mm -hmm. to do this job in the Watergate. And this all came out at the trial. They had nothing at all to do with the plumbers as such. And no, to no, matter of fact, the plumbers was a, was a, a project that existed for only about five months, way back in uh, 1971. 
uh, a, over a year before any, the, the break-in at the Watergate. So there was just no relation between the two at all. Well, now as, as to why they did such a bum job, um, I, I commend you to a, a book by a man named Haugen, H-O-U-G-A-N, called Secret Agenda that came out last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the best explanation of what went wrong and why that I have seen around. Oh, that's right. uh, what about... Oh, excuse me, John, I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say, his basic theory is that the CIA deliberately uh, sabotaged that operation. Well, you know, I've heard other speculation, John, that, you know, and, and well-founded or not, I don't know, uh, mm-hmm. that, that the Democrats uh, were even involved in this and, and that, uh, indeed, Liddy and Hunt were working for the Democrats. Well, now, Hagen, Hagen has investigated that and, and I think pretty well laid that one to rest. But, you know, there are so many questions about this thing that were never answered. And Hagen points out that there never really was an investigation. Neither the police nor the FBI nor anyone else really investigated that burglary. Yes. Doug, thank you very much for calling. I want to get back to uh, to the China card for a moment. We uh, we will go back to the phones in just a moment for John Ehrlichman, the author of the China card. Coincidence that this happened uh, during the Cultural Revolution? Uh, was it advantageous that it did? Would it have worked five years earlier or five years later? Good question, and that's really the whole point of the book. Uh, when I was in China about three and a half years ago, it occurred to me that uh, there must be a good deal more to the coming together of the two countries than just Richard Nixon getting a bright idea. And, it, and when you stop to think about it, being in the culture, in the midst of the Cultural Revolution as they were, China really needed an alliance with the United States every bit as badly as we needed them, and probably more. Their economy was in terrible shape. The Soviets were threatening on their northern border, and I mean really threatening massing troops and and um, uh, making all sorts of bellicose threats. Oh, this was the time when both sides were massing troops on the border then? That's right. Okay. That's right. And, of course, the way the China card starts is with Zhou Enlai sending for an old diplomat who's been banished to a pig farm during the Cultural Revolution, and he brings him back because he's an American expert. And he says, you've got to, you've got to help me to work on an alliance with the United States. We desperately need it. And uh, I think probably you put your finger on exactly why it worked when it did. Because of the Cultural Revolution, China was in such difficulty that it, it became possible for Nixon's seed to sprout and, and become a, a rep. Earlier or five years later. Right. Okay. We're talking to John Ehrlichman, uh, the author of The China Card. And let's go to the phones. Rod from Kettering. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. I've got a couple of questions from Mr. Ehrlichman. The first one would be, if he has any animosity toward Richard Nixon for um, his part in, for, for example, the fact that Mr. Nixon was pardoned for crimes he says he wasn't guilty of, which is a hard feat to do. And the other part is that if he feels no animosity, at what point in time did Mr. Nixon have such complete control over his people that they would be willing to commit felonies? <clears throat> well, the, the, for answer to your first question, I, I think I can honestly say I, I don't have any animosity toward uh, Nixon or anybody else. This is such a uh, far away, closed chapter in my life now. I just don't pack that kind of emotion around. As far as why people did what they did for him, uh, after you've after you've worked in the White House a while, you get used to the pattern, and the pattern is for you to give the very best advice you can to a president. I don't care whether it's Nixon or any other president, and then he makes a decision, and once he makes a decision, you abide. So that was what was going on during this this time of crisis. I don't think anybody really realized at the time that it was as serious a crisis as it was until we got well into 1973. But uh, people were giving him advice right along. Uh, people gave him advice along the line that we discussed a while ago, to step out and make a clean breast of things and put it behind him. 
but he just couldn't bring himself to do that. Well, okay, that was his decision. And that being his decision, then everybody abided it. And uh, when you come right down to it, some of the, I would say most of the things that people in the White House were charged with as a result of this whole episode uh, were in that category of having um, uh, gone along with the decisions that he made rather than having gone off and gone into business for themselves in one way or another. Okay. okay. I thank you very much for calling, Rod. Our number is 457-1410 in Springfield and Clark County, 1-800-835-1410. John Ehrlichman, the author of The China Card, will be with us for about another 17 or 18 minutes. If you have a question or a comment, the number is 457-1410, Author uh, of The China Card, John Ehrlichman, with us, uh, Simon & Schuster, uh, the publishers. And uh, is this an advance uh, copy, or is it out already, uh, no, it's John? it's out. It is out, okay. It's out if, since uh, early June. Okay, so if, uh, if the bookstore does not have it, shout, and uh, they will get it for you. Um, have we... Uh, I realize the, um, I don't know how intricately you follow the developments in uh, in China at this point in your life, but uh, I know, of course, that uh, the, the, the Chinese are experimenting with capitalism to some degree and uh, that, uh, indeed, American enterprises have set up shop uh, in China. Uh, but have we, have we uh, taken full advantage? Have we nurtured this as much as we should have? I think we're working at it pretty well. I was there about three years ago. And there are a great many American com companies in there anxious to do business with the Chinese. It's, it's tough to do. It's tough to make an arrangement because they're, they're still not very good at this game. Um, they've been uh, a monolithic society for so long that uh, getting geared up to do joint ventures with foreigners is, is uh, a tough thing for them. But um, uh, we're encouraging uh, them along this path of, uh, of sort of economic experimentation that they that they're engaged in, and um, uh, it, it's it's still very touch and go. I think um, Deng Xiaoping, who's the strong man in China, is very elderly, as you know. Yes. And uh, nobody really knows what's going to happen uh, if he dies. Uh, there is a conservative element in China, who is, 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 which is essentially Maoist, and which resists these changes, uh, the so-called uh, contract system and the responsibility system, uh, where people get to keep uh, the fruits of their labors, um, is is uh, not well received in some quarters. So there's there's a good deal of resistance. So it's still uh, it's still kind of up for grabs, I think. Is Nixon still one of our, uh, our our greatest emissaries, if you will, to China? Absolutely. Yeah, he's a hero over there. Uh, the only reason that I was as well treated as I was when I went uh, is because I had once worked for him, and uh, he he can do no wrong in China. Okay, let's go back to the phones for John Ehrlichman and Mary from East Dayton. Hello. Good evening, Mike, and good evening, Mr. Ehrlichman. Good evening. Uh -huh. First, I'd like to preface this by saying that I do support former President Nixon, and I realize that the things he did were not proper. I know that. I know that he should have revealed the tapes. He should have come out and openly confessed to things, but I think he did try to protect his friends. I've always felt that. But uh, I feel that he, his knowledge on foreign policy is so invaluable, and I do believe that, that most, there's most doubt, undoubtedly, that President Reagan has uh, secretly t discussed things with him, especially on uh, the peace talks with Russia and things of that sort. Now, here's what I want to ask you. Do you feel, in your opinion, that there are still now, at the present time, living in Vietnam some MIAs? goodness i haven't any idea hmm. i've read what's been in the press and that's really all i know about it you don't have any uh as, as the saying goes gut feeling that there could possibly be because now the people that have <clears throat> excuse me have proposed that possibly that they are that there are some that they have seen some do you suppose that they're wrong 
that this is just a fabrication of somebody's imagination trying to get publicity or, or something? Uh, I really don't know. You know that one of the one of the terribly frustrating things about having worked in the White House and then and then not being there is that you you miss a tremendous amount of information. And uh, sitting out here 2,000 miles away from Washington, as I do, uh, it's it's awfully difficult for me to uh, 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 evaluate some of these things. You can bet that there are people, probably in the White House, people like Don Regan, who could definitively answer your question. But I'm sorry to say I cannot. Is 2,000 miles far enough away from Washington? or uh... It's just about right. No, I, I was going to ask you. Fishing gets pretty good out here. <laughs> well, I think you answered my next question, because one of them I did want to ask was, uh, if, you know, and, and obviously because of the ties to Watergate, it would not have happened, but, you know, had a Ronald Reagan said to John Ehrlichman, I would like you to be my chief counsel, uh, what would you have said? I'd say, uh, thanks, but no thanks. Okay. I've done that. And, uh... This is, uh, again, a, a book I am looking forward to reading, The China Card. It is published by Simon & Schuster. We have uh, just a few more minutes with John Ehrlichman. We are going to take a break, and when we come back, uh, a few closing comments. And if you have any comments, thoughts, or questions, the number is 457-1410. 1410, WYNG, the exclusive voice of the Cincinnati Bengals. Join us for the kickoff of the 1986 season as the Bengals take on the Kansas City Chiefs in preseason action Saturday night. Bengal airtime, 8 o'clock. Cincinnati Bengal football is brought to you by Northern Constellation Systems, Winnie's Market, Smart Concept Promotions, and Branch Car Rental on Dayton Sports Connection, 1410, WYNG. Dayton Speaks, W-I-N-G listens. Do you think the government is spending enough money to fight drug abuse? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yes. Uh, when I was at the high school, they're doing a lot at the high school. Um, they now have a drug counselor, and, and they're starting more prog programs. Oh, uh, no. I think they're investing <laughs> in the drug problem. I don't know. It's maybe through uh, corrupt of the mafias or something. I really, I don't know. Just from, you know, let's say DeLorean, for instance, setting him up the way they did, because I really think they did. There's a lot of people that have drug problems, but I guess they don't. Well, from what I've seen so far, I don't think they've done enough. Uh, it looks like it's pretty serious in this country. And hopefully they'll spend a little more on that and a little less on foreign aid and some of this other stuff. Take, a little, take care of a little few things here at the house. I know the drug problem is serious, but it seems like they are putting quite a bit of emphasis on it. And, of course, all these activities take funding, so it must be mounting to a, a fair amount of money. Be watching for me, Bill Nance, and the Dayton Speaks microphone in your area. One. I am upset. One. I mean, I am extremely upset. What's One. the matter? I got this snippy letter from the manager of the finance company. Yeah? Uh -huh. I am I am so mad. I may call the national headquarters and file a complaint. What, right. what did the letter say? Well, here it is. What does it say? It says, Dear Mr. Lovelace, after checking our records, we note that we have done more for you than even your mother did. Whoa. We've carried you for 15 months. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> the fun is back in the afternoon with Kay and Metzger on Radio 1410 WING. Hi, this mutual is Larry King inviting you to give Mike Sinto a call at 457 1410 and then stay tuned with WING at 11 for more great interviews and Open Phone America on The Larry King Show. John Ehrlichman with us uh, on the Newsmaker line, the author of The China Card, published by Simon & Schuster. And uh, true statement in the liner notes that, uh, or, or uh, fiction, that Henry Kissinger, uh, fiercely ambitious, so anxious uh, to be in the limelight that he almost takes it away from the president. The president doesn't want me to be the first American to meet the Chinese in Peking, uh, but he doesn't have the guts to say it to my face. Well, that's a, that's a line out of the book. Yes. And there's a there's a scene in the book where Nixon's trying to decide who to send to China mm -hmm. on this secret mission, and uh, he's he's discussing it with Kissinger, and and what he what he finally comes up with is the idea that uh, Kissinger should meet with Zhou Enlai 
someplace else, uh, maybe Shanghai, maybe on neutral territory. And uh, Kissinger, uh, they negotiate through the through the hero of the book, uh, Matt Thompson, the fictional uh, young lawyer, uh, back and forth. First Nixon calls him in and says, "Tell Henry this and that," and then Henry calls him in and says, "Well, uh, the Chinese will never go for that," and and uh, goes back and forth. And pretty soon it becomes clear to Matt that what they're doing is maneuvering to see who is going to be the first one to have his picture taken on the Great Wall. And um, uh, so when he when he reports back to the Chinese uh, what's going on in the White House, he he tells them that this is the bone of contention, and he gives them some advice as to how to handle it. Do you like writing? Yeah, yeah. It's a good it's a good way of life, and it's a. Uh, it's something that gives me a sense of accomplishment when I get a piece done. Uh, so I like it very much. Are you uh, are you one of those writers uh, who feels the pressure to, you know, I've got to get this next chapter out, or do you write as it comes to you? Well, I write every day. Mm -hmm. I, um, I come up and sit down at 8 o'clock in the morning and start in. And uh, most days it flows pretty well. But I don't set some sort of rigid quota for myself. If I do 15 pages in a day, handwritten, why, that's a good day. Okay. <laughs> I, I uh, reward myself in some way or other. Uh -huh. If I don't get 15 done, that's all right, too. Pat from Trotwood, you're on with John Ehrlichman. Yes, uh, Mike, uh, Mr. Ehrlichman, yes. I would like very much to, uh, to ask you a question that's been on my mind for years, because I, too, am still a fan of uh, Richard Nixon's. Uh, I've had a gut feeling all these years since Deep Throat has never been identified, I cannot get it out of my head that uh, uh, Kissinger was Deep Throat. Well, John has already said, he, he answered earlier, you may not have been listening. That, uh, I, I probably yeah. couldn't hear you. He has, he has no idea who it was. He doesn't think anybody who he knows knows who it was. Well, I've just felt that way, and also that uh, uh, I just it's just based on Call it a gut feeling, if you like, that somebody really close to him was betraying him. I'm and not so sure that Henry really knew all of the things that uh, Woodward and Bernstein claimed that they me, got Mr. from deep throat. Excuse me, sir. I have a hearing problem. May I hang up and listen? Okay, to sure. Me? Yeah, go ahead. Go Thank ahead. You, Mike. Thank you. You were saying you're not sure yeah, that I'm. I'm not so sure that Henry answers the description as uh, you know of all of the that he would have had possession of all of the information that the boys claimed they got from Deep Throat. I have a I have a friend who has the same publisher who says that in the first manuscript version of um, of all the president's men there wasn't any Deep Throat. Uh, now uh, that's Cy Hirsch, the investigative reporter. That's Cy's story. Uh, I don't know whether that's true or not, but uh, makes us, it makes a pretty good story anyway. Yes, it does. Um, are you? I, I don't know if you've ever speculated on on this. I'm sure you have. What would have happened uh, had uh, had the doors to China not been opened? Uh, do you see an alliance, or eventually, or a war with the Soviet Union uh, with the Chinese? Well, I think it's entirely possible that there could have been a conflict on the on the border between China and Russia, and that the United States would have had a very very strong national interest in the outcome of that, and probably would have been forced to take a position one way or the other, probably on the side of China. And it would have been a very difficult situation. How did our, uh, how did our involvement with China uh, prevent that? Well, we sent, some, we sent some diplomatic messages to Russia uh, during, the, during the time that we were negotiating with the Chinese. When uh, Russia began openly discussing the chance for the possibility of a preemptive strike against China, uh, the president passed the word through Elliot Richardson and through um, our diplomats uh, that uh, we would we would take that as uh, an act hostile to the interests of the United States, and that cooled things down. Okay, do you, uh, we only have a couple of more minutes left, and I, I, do you correspond at all with any of the other uh, folks who you served with in the White House? Well, yeah, I see them. I, I'm not that great a letter writer, but uh, I, I do see and, and visit with some of them. Uh, not By no means all of them, but uh, 
some that became my very good friends when I was working there. Okay. Uh, Jean from Beaver Creek, a quick question. Hi, just a comment. I didn't want him to get away thinking that everyone here in Dayton still feels, as everyone has expressed, their feelings about Mr. Nixon. I still feel very betrayed. I'm still, uh, I still have a sour taste in my mouth when I see him on TV. I think he should stay out of politics. Having said that, I would like to say that I think Mr. Ehrlichman was the most handsome man in the whole Nixon administration. <laughs> well, the years have passed, my I dear. I thought that long ago. And I... <laughs> oh, that's very kind of you. A dashing man indeed. <laughs> Thank you, Gene. Bye bye. Uh, four five seven fourteen ten. But we are uh, we are just about out of time. We are wrapping up with John Ehrlichman, uh, the author of uh, a novel, The China Card, which is uh, published by Simon and Schuster. Also, uh, the author of uh, several other works, The Company, uh, which became the television uh, the television movie uh, Washington Behind Closed Doors. The Whole Truth and Witness to Power, the Nixon years. And, uh, Mr. Ehrlichman, it has indeed been a pleasure to have you on the air. Well, thank you. It's been fun being with you. Thank you so much, sir. Bye-bye. Bye. Uh, again, 457-1410 is our number uh, in Springfield and Clark County, 1-800-835-1410. The China card, which I have in my hand right now and intend to uh, to curl up with next to, uh, next to the fire and read... Uh, with a lot of interest now. John Ehrlichman, uh, uh, indeed a fascinating man. You are listening to Radio 1410 WING, Dayton Springfield, ABC News is next.